This is poverty. It recognizes no color, no creed. It is neither Negro nor white. It is not Jewish, nor Catholic, nor Protestant. It is poverty, very plain and very simple. It is poverty, not foreign, not out of state, not even out of town. This poverty is here in Cincinnati, in our town. If you've known poverty, known its biting cold, its gnawing hunger, and its hopeless feeling, you'll never forget it. But if poverty is a stranger to you, watch closely. We'd like you to meet and remember. Remember the name. It's poverty. city, and a queen she is, but with a crown that's soiled, soiled by poverty. The substandard housing where the impoverished are forced to live scars our landscape east to west, north to south. For example, here's a petite palace you might rent. It's only good for a small family, say five, maybe six. After all, even two rooms can get crowded. But the price is right, only $25 a month. In case we forgot, there's no hot water and no bath. However, you might prefer some of the other prime housing surrounding the area. If you move to this neighborhood, we hope you don't mind sharing. The rats and roaches currently in residence will be glad to have new neighbors. And wherever we look, we see crowded, badly maintained, substandard housing jammed together, forming a solid mass of misery. On the lower west side, much of the slums was raised for the Mill Creek Expressway and a few, far too few, modern low-cost housing units. But as you can plainly see, there's much still to be done. These are busy streets and sidewalks. There are many, many people living behind the run-down brick fronts and in the drafty rooms over the cheap stores and beer joints. And still more, dreary, look-alike, unclean, and unkempt, but cheap, and peopled by those without the means for the better, the cleaner, and naturally the more expensive. Yet, amidst all this evidence of poverty, we find our bright spot, a ray of hope, Sand School, where, in a third grade class, a small boy and his classmates have a belief that could change the hopeless feeling suffered by the poverty-stricken. Not long ago, this class visited a Cincinnati City Council hearing on poverty. When they returned, their teacher asked each one to write a story in his own way about what they had seen and heard. Willie Grimes wrote a classic message for all the human race, a lucid, profound belief, far wiser than his few years. Willie, in his youth, has not yet learned to hate or give up or accept any way of life as his fate. Willie knows there are better things. He's seen them in pictures and in passing, and he intends to have better things. Willie represents his entire class. They work 
and they enjoy it. And they believe. They believe the world is good and that tomorrow will be better. They believe they'll rise above their squalid beginnings. And they believe in their teacher. Their teacher is Miss Sandra Lewis, a dedicated young woman. To Miss Lewis, this is a very special class, one in which she has faith and trust. And she believes. She believes in her work. She believes tomorrow will be better. And she believes in trying. This last belief she's passed on to her class. Maybe we can pass it to you if we let Miss Lewis read what Willie Grimes wrote. Our neighborhood is the West End. Some people call our neighborhood a slum. A slum is a part of a city with dirty streets, slop, poor people, and criminals, and wine heads who stay in the streets. We do live in a slum, but everything is not slop in our neighborhood. It is not bad to be poor, but it is bad not to try. Our neighborhood is important because we have things that other neighborhoods need. Home things, our factories, our post office, our meat packing houses, Crosley Field. and the terminal station. We think that some people are wrong because everybody in the West End is not a slum person. If Willie Grimes can only keep believing he's not a slum person, he never will be. And someday, he'll put poverty behind him. The scars of poverty aren't limited to our lower west side. We can go east and pass rundown house after rundown house for block after block. Poverty is not restricted to the dramatic picture of crowded tenements where small, dark, cold water flats are stacked one on another. Even in the city, poverty comes in houses. Houses with yards, not lawns, but yards. We see houses. Inhabited houses, missing shingles, siding and glass, torn screens, rickety steps, crumbling chimneys, and dirt. Dirt from factories, railroads, trucks, and years of decay. We can see trash littering the streets, back alleys, and yards of the houses where people live who don't have the means to do better or else just don't care. And what about these slum dwellers, these poverty-stricken who just don't care? How did they get this way? Why are they so suspicious, so close-mouthed? What are they afraid of? They are, you know. They hesitate to talk to strangers, and when they do, they say very little, and they're constantly looking around as if some danger is nearby. They appear to be absolutely beaten by their circumstances. We all want to eliminate poverty, and to do so, we must start with the people. We must know the why and the how of the people who live behind these shabby fronts. With some, it's been adversity, bad breaks or sickness that repeatedly beats a man down until he only continues on dazed and hopelessly bewildered by the world around him. Some are infected by the people around them. They see so much of the desolation that is poverty, they are pulled into it. And poverty, like rising water, reaches higher and higher to engulf more and more, even in an age of plenty. Others, most in fact, inherit poverty. 
It's handed down to them like some ulcerous legacy from their fathers. Indeed, poverty is inherited. The poor beget poor. And it goes on and on and on. A common sight as we pass the small, patched up house of poverty is the old broken down refrigerator standing sentinel-like in the yard. When it quit, there was nothing else to do but move it outside and replace it with another second or third-hand model. Meanwhile, the old guard stands there, not even worth hauling away. And we continue on, seeing more and more the signs of poverty. There are always plenty of for rent signs in the slum area. This seems an excellent value. Five rooms, only $40. And the luxury of a bath. A basic item often missing in the homes of the poverty stricken. But even for the poor, the convenience of a bath is offset by the location. For in the spring, it rains. $40 house has a drawback. But this is no exception. When the floods come, the poor usually suffer first, and their almost annual loss helps keep them poor. But when wet or dry, the poverty-stricken have no choice. This is what they can afford, and this is what they get. On higher ground, some areas are no better. In passing, only cold exteriors meet the eye. Rarely are the doors open to strangers. Broken down porches, torn siding, or worn boards are a poor cover, but they tell only a small part of the story. Inside the house of poverty, a more drastic tale is told. Three rooms for $50 a month, including this kitchen. The range on the left is the only source of heat for the entire apartment. At best, an oven is an inefficient heater. Linked to drafty windows and a front door with no glass, the heating bill climbs to $45 a month during the winter. Total outlay for rent and heat, $95 which would normally rent a larger and better home, except no one wants to rent to a mother with five children and an uncertain income. We did say six people live here. One sleeps in this crib. It's wired together and just manages to hold up. The rest sleep here in the same room. Another corner opens to a closet-like affair with a toilet. There is no bath. The living room is sparsely furnished. This chair, another, not quite as nice, and a very low-slung couch, in addition to the radio cabinet, make up the entire furnishings. The couch is low because the legs are broken off, and the radio cabinet is empty. A mother and five children live in three rooms without bath and not even the bare essentials for comfort. More of the same, crowded, filthy, inadequate for human beings, yet peopled by the poverty-stricken, closed-mouthed, suspicious, often afraid they secret themselves behind their closed doors, shutting out an unkind world. This building once housed Cincinnati General Hospital. That was over a hundred years ago. Decades passed, it was declared unfit 
condemned as a hospital, but still deemed fit as home for those who can't afford better. We went inside this old hospital to show you the condition here. However, its cavernous interior was so dark, filming was impossible. We must leave the inside to your imagination. Downtown, East Side, West Side, Delhi, Fairfax, Madisonville, Mount Auburn, Walnut Hills, and many other sections show the scars of poverty. In Mount Adams, the evidence is plentiful. We've already shown some, and there is more. Poverty scars one side of the street, while the other shows great progress. But scarcely within the budget afforded the poor. We've shown a lot of real estate, mostly run down and substandard. Substandard, that's an official term for the tight housing the poverty stricken are forced to occupy. This is what we see of poverty, the surface, the landmarks. What we feel is another matter. We feel compassion and sympathy, and we feel it another way. We feel it in our community pocketbook. The dictionary defines poverty as need, especially lack of money. That's lack of money. But poverty is very expensive. Poverty costs our community hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in relief funds, unemployment, waste man hours, the crime it breeds, and the destruction and depreciation of property. Two blocks from one of our finest hospitals, we come on conditions like this. What a wonderful place for our children to play. What a wonderful place. The young and the old alike are hurt by poverty. The old sit idly by passing their days with too little of even the necessities, while the young are cursed as shiftless or delinquent. But most of the young among the poverty-stricken want to move up, and they'll work to do it, if they're allowed to. This is Clifford Watson, a young man with no place to go. Clifford's not going to school, and he's not going to work. He's 18 years old with an eighth grade education, and he's going no place. This is Eddie Dean Wilson, another young man with no place to go. Like Clifford, poverty pulled him away from school, and that same poverty denies him a job, a job that might, just might, lift him out of poverty. These boys are one and the same, true, their race is different, and Eddie is two years younger, but poverty has struck them into the same mold. There's little work for a young Negro boy with only eight years of school. Clifford would like to go back and get a high school diploma, but it's very hard to concentrate on studies when your belly hurts from hunger. It's also very hard for a young man to get a job when he has no special skills and weak eyes that desperately need glasses. There's even less work for a 16-year-old. Eddie quit school last year when he could no longer bear the jibes about his worn and mended jeans or the insulting name River Trash. Besides, a family on welfare needs money, and Eddie earned his last year as a caddy on a local golf course. He did have a brief tenure as a painter's helper, but that ended when a painter got drunk and nearly ran him down with a truck. He went back to caddying Golf balls are less dangerous than trucks. Clifford feels lucky when he gets a few hours labor at a car wash or an occasional day's painting and cleanup in an apartment owned by the family landlord. But there are nine in the Watson family, and welfare has never managed to satisfy their hunger. Clifford needs a steady job, but two years have passed since he's had one. Days of walking, days of walking nowhere in particular. 
Cliff does have a girlfriend. There's no money for dates. But they visit and usually watch TV at her house. Sometimes a quarter takes him to the neighborhood bar where a bottle of 3-2 beer, he's old enough, and talk with his friends erases temporarily the gloom brought about by days of nothingness, days of no place to go. Behind the tavern door and all about us are others, others with no place to go. Eddie Dean Wilson walks too. He walks to hunt a job, or visit a friend, or find any diversion to take his mind off the problems of poverty. Aimless walking, it leads many into trouble with the law. They don't want to be in trouble, but they have nothing to do, and that usually leads to trouble. Help is needed but there isn't enough of it. Organizations like the local Citizens Committee on Youth try, but they're understaffed and short of funds and too often are inadequate. So while he waits for tomorrow, Eddie Wilson visits friends or kills time hanging around the corner store where he might drink a bottle of pop if he has a dime. These young men look at a future which holds little promise. The landscape of poverty stands ugly and is easy to see, but these young products of poverty, poverty which they didn't create, are too often overlooked. What is the future to be for the young people of poverty? Are they damned to grow into men and women carrying the burden of poverty for all their lives? Or can we, as a society, erase the evil that curses us all. The older ones don't get into trouble. They just sit and do nothing. Their today is cheerless and dismal. Tomorrow looks no better, and there are few, if any, fond memories. At any age, it is hard when you're poor, but it is hardest of all for the old. Their earning power has been weakened by age until practically nothing is left and their declining years are wasted. Soon, the simplest pleasures become a luxury. Welfare, relief, aid to dependent children, unemployment compensation, no matter what the monthly check is called, it is never enough. The governmental agencies supplying aid to the poverty-stricken rarely can meet the full demands made on them, and the monies allowed by the law won't cover the need. The poverty-stricken handle their meager checks nervously. They know they're insufficient, and the last few days of every month are always hungry ones. You've met poverty, Cincinnati poverty. Not all, but part. We could never show all of poverty. How can we show you an empty stomach or a feeling of hopelessness? How can we show you a destroyed ambition or shame or fear? And how can we show you desperation desperation that often ends in crime as a way of life, or alcohol as an escape. In these brief minutes, we have shown you some of the poverty many condemn for laziness and dirt and crime, but we've offered no solution to this problem. We have none. There's no panacea to cure poverty except to try. Trying is the responsibility of each and every one of us. For poverty is a waste, a needless waste of the land it exists on 
and a needless waste of the human beings it destroys. Poverty affects us all, and we must all try to blot it out. Willie Grimes set forth the truth when he wrote, it is not bad to be poor, but it is bad not to try.